Yep. Just happened to be the spot he needed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone, to the uh, April 20, 2018 uh, Community Engagement Workshop of the Scarborough Town Council. We have with us today uh, the uh, Scarborough Public Library trustees. And uh, we're going to have a workshop to discuss what's happening with the library and what their planning process is. And I think we're going to start with a presentation to start and then followed by a discussion, a roundtable discussion amongst all of us as to uh, what your goals and, and uh, plans are for the uh, near future. So with that, I'll turn it over to Emily. All right. Well, thank you. I'm Emily Reed. I'm the president of the Board of Trustees this year. And um, thank you, first and foremost, for having us. Um, we are all really excited, and by we, I mean the board and the staff that's represented here tonight. There's so much great stuff happening at the library, and we'll get to share some of that with you here as the evening goes on. Um, on behalf of the board in particular, we are really proud of this organization and being a part of it, and we are always impressed with Nancy and her passion and her vision and um, her stewardship of the resources that the library has, and it's been a pleasure to work with her and, and watch it all uh, unfold. Um, we're also joined here tonight by, um, we've got some board members at the table. We have our Vice President, Kevin Carbon, um, Nick McKelvey, our Treasurer, Bill Honorado, and we also have some library staff here as well, Catherine Morrison, um, the Assistant Library Director, Tom Corbett, the Information Technology Director, and um, our Head of Youth Services, Louise Capizio. So we'll touch on all the you know, great things that the um, library does and all the different touch points within the community. With that said, as um, as a prelude, I guess, I'll turn it over to Nancy. Thank you. And I am going to use the PowerPoint. Um, and I apologize in advance, I did not, um, Tom and I did not bring the robot, we talked about that, um, but we thought it might distract. So as Emily's just explained to you, we're um, going to cover a lot this afternoon and for evening as quickly as I can because really what we want to do is get to the bottom of that list and that's have a conversation. And we are going to quickly describe our organization and funding because I realize some of you aren't familiar with the background of the library. It will be brief, but I also want to talk a little bit about the wonderful services we're offering. Again, we'll try to be brief and to fill in gaps. I brought copies of our newsletter, which I believe you may have received electronically as well, and our annual report also we try to send out to you in advance. And um, there's interest in a building project, I understand. So I wanted to give you a little background <coughs> on where we came to this point and talk a little bit about our strategic planning session, which we are in the midst of right now, which is where you fit in at the end. <coughs> so our organization is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation, which was founded in 1899 by a group of people from the First Congregational Church here at Scarborough on Black Point Road. We currently have a 14-member board of trustees. Twelve of them are elected by the board. One of them is a voting member from the town council, and one of them is a voting member from the library friends. We co-own our assets or our building with the town of Scarborough. At the time we built our current facility, we made an effort to find a way through our bylaws of leaving the last uh, statement of ownership to the council. So if our library for some reason ceases to exist, the town council has the final say on the disposition of the assets. And we are on property leased from the town and we pay 99 years ahead. So dollar a year, $99. We do have obviously support from the town of Scarborough for our operating budget and this year it was 91%. That number varies two to three percentage points depending on what's happening. Uh, we do have an annual appeal that we expect to raise each year. This year's goal with some trepidation is $47,000. We hope to make that. We are away from it yet, but um, that's a goal that we, we feel obligated <laughs> to match. We 
we also have a small amount of fines and fees and bank interest that um, supplement that income stream. And then the Friends of the Library contribute about 10, 000, well, over $10,000 a year, primarily from their book sale, um, also from some memberships. And then we get occasional gifts and memorials from folks. We also have uh, begun a uh, special society called the 1899 Society, which is in recognition of those folks who have named the library in their estate plan. Our services and programs obviously are for people of all ages, and uh, this four points is just really a framework for what we offer. Our babies uh, last bit is a, an initiative we've had for quite a while, but we've supplemented it or enhanced it with a membership in the Family Place Library uh, Consortium. And this is a, a structured opportunity for us to offer play, realia, that's a library term for toys, um, but ways of, of bringing real social <coughs> learning skills to babies and very young children. We also have reading groups, story times have been a tradition since the Friends of the Library started them in the 1970s. And we have um, reading groups for junior age students as well. So the, the young folks have a reading group as well. The um, elementary school, middle school, intermediate school kids are all involved in reading groups at some point. We also have, in the last few years, uh, implemented a teen advisory board. As you know, the teen population after school is very energetic, <laughs> uh, and uh, we appreciate them. But we also have a wonderful leadership core called the Teen Advisory Board, and they have been helping us plan the programming for the teens after school and have been doing a super job of it. Mm -hmm. And we have a real traditional program now called the Teen Lock, and it used to be the lock out and lock down, but um, that's a bad term now. So um, we, we shut down the library on a Friday night, turn it over to the kids for games, and they're very creative, do wonderful things like book dominoes, I've seen it as something to witness. <laughs> um, ping pong on top of the library table, there's no end to what they can do in our library. So that's a real popular opportunity. But one of the things that that message, is, it's a message to the kids that the library cares about them, that we respect them, that we trust them, and um, we can do great things together. And obviously, we have wonderful adult programs, so many that we don't have enough time or space to offer everything that we'd like to offer. And we are consider ourselves sort of, my favorite term is opportunistic. If there's an opportunity for us to partner with somebody, we'll try to do that and bring in a program. And the bottom line is not a small item. It's the fact that we are free to all, really special for part. Our library's physical collection, which many people think of as the library. This is um, not something we think about very much anymore because our collection is so much more than a physical object. But we do have a nice collection of DVDs. Large type books, interestingly, are coming um, back and are very popular right now to the point where we are asking for an increase in funding to help support the large type books. You all know about the demographic in this community. We are an older community. We also, many of us suffer from eye strain because of the number of electronic devices that we use. So the large type book has actually become a very popular collection item again. And we have a nice collection of books on CD-ROM. We also have, surprisingly, very popular still, um, hardcover, hard copy magazine and newspapers. We also are going to be looking into more subscriptions electronically. We do have newspapers online as well. So beyond the library walls, it's not just the collection you see inside, it's what we can access. So we have a phrase that we like to say, it's not about ownership, it's about access. And our access is through a consortium of libraries called Minerva. We get deliveries five days a week from our 65 member libraries. This uh, offers us tens of hundreds of thousands of titles that we can't keep within our walls. We also can go beyond this consortium to MainCat, which captures then the academic libraries and the larger public libraries and all of their collections. And if that isn't good enough, and generally it is, we can actually go out of state into an international database called WorldCat. So if you have a need for information, whether it's a hardcover book or whether it's a journal article, there's an excellent chance that we're going to be able to get it for you with one of these resources. We have a growing collection of e-books <coughs> and audiobooks. Um, e-audiobooks, we have a couple of services available. 
The first one on the left is the Download Library, which is a cooperative venture through the State Library. And the one on the right is uh, a picture of our, what used to be called the 3M Cloud Library, now it's called Cloud Library, because uh, 3M Library Services have been sold to another company. So don't look for the little red 3M any longer. <laughs> The uh, cloud library, both versions of them are expanding, and we expect this to be a, um, a growing collection. We're not limited by ideas for our programming. We're just limited by the available space and the staff planning time that it takes and the promotion that it takes. So we appreciate the, the help of citizens who are volunteering to help us facilitate some of the programs we are offering and I'll mention those in just a moment. Uh, our monthly movie has become so popular that we've had to turn people away. It's a particularly popular event for seniors. It's done in the afternoon when it's still daylight and we run first rate movies. We in a public library have to have a license to show a movie mm -hmm. because it's a public performance. That FBI warning you see on the front of a movie means something. Uh, so we have a license that we have to pay but it allows us to show some wonderful movies. The Friends of the Library support that movie license as well. Here's a sampling of some of the partnerships that we have um, that we've um, been very successful with in our programming. And I'll read them for those of you who can't make a mile. The uh, Camden Conference has done a number of programs with us annually. Maine Historical Society, Biolocal, and the Chamber of Commerce are both, um, we are members of both, and we participate in continuing education in the business community. World Affairs Council has programs with the Maine Historical Society and Museum. We've done some wonderful grants with them, which has taken history into the schools as part of the partnership. Uh, Maine Humanities Council, we often have reading discussion and uh, current topics, reading programs with them. Uh, Agency on Aging, we are uh, active partners with them in, in uh, programming that we're offering. We actually are having a financial uh, literacy three-part series uh, starting tomorrow night, I believe, um, and running for three weeks, which is partly thanks to their cooperation. AARP tax aid wrapped up last Thursday night. You've probably heard the hurrahs, mm -hmm. um, but that's a, a very important service that we can offer at our library. Um, we also, another example is coming up uh, in a few weeks, we have Maine Department of Labor coming with their Career Center and Good Work with the Workforce to do programs on um, pre preparing yourself for workforce readiness. Um, we've also we participate in community outreach um, examples or project grades and um, Scarborough Kindness Project. If there's a way for us to help facilitate, um, we try to do that. Some fun pictures. They're a little um, busy because um, they're big like that. But let me just quickly mention the one. The one on the upper left is a drumming program we had with the Camden Conference, and that's an example of use of our space as creative as we can be. We move all of the furniture from the center core of the building. We put it on glides. We are strong. Uh, <laughs> and we put seating down the center of the whole building and put the performers at the back end of the building. So that's a creative use of space. The center is, again, we take over the whole building. That's our Fiber Arts Day. So this is a person who's doing weaving um, in one part of the library where they obviously put stacks and back. Uh, again, use of space on the outside. We have a, on the right, we have a performance that was uh, to celebrate our new logo. Um, that's a bluegrass band to tie in with our grass theme logo. Uh, the lower right is the, uh, in honor of our French conversation group, which is an example of a group that's facilitated by citizens. We have in the middle our weekly knitting group, multi-generational, so a young man learning how to knit with one of the participants. And then on the lower um, left is a, a display that was part of our community-wide read program with the Maine Humanities Council, Maine Historical Society. We had a partnership with four different nonprofits for that. It was huge and very, very successful. So that's um, member of the Earth, uh, their represent representations of Civil War uniforms. This is just a reminder of how fantastic our friends in the library is. We have the book sale coming up, and that's this year going to be a school, so we can spread out and sell lots of books. Uh, we have um, 
the book pages, which is a, a little tabloid that gives you uh, books that you might want to read. The friends sponsor our museum passes, which currently are the Main Wildlife Park, Main State Park, Children's Museum, and the Portland Museum of Art. And they make a very nice con uh, donation to our collections as well. <coughs> The Friends actually, in the 70s, I mentioned they started story time, but they also started an outreach program to shut in, where they took mm -hmm. large print books to people who were homebound, mm -hmm. and that's become such a really important service that it's part of our mission now. We have volunteers as well as staff people who will pull together materials, reading, audio, whatever the person needs, go to the person's home, mm -hmm. deliver it in person, and that touch point is really, really important to these folks. We try to keep it as the same person delivery so they develop a relationship. So when we get to their door, we might detect <coughs> some kind of a, a problem that they need some assistance with. We also um, can go to their home and teach them how to download books or whatever technology they might be struggling with at home. Um, how many of you have gotten a device from a child or, or somebody and you didn't know how to operate it? Well, this is an example of how the Library Geek Squad comes in. <laughs> Scarborough Digital Newspaper Archive is a fairly new initiative for us. We were very fortunate to receive a substantial grant from the Morton Kelly Charitable Trust to have all of our community newspaper files digitized. So this is now available on our website. You can go into the library website, find the newspaper icon, and you can search these newspapers by keyword, and it is so much fun. It's phenomenal, and we want to keep this updated, so that's also an item in our budget that we're trying to uh, incorporate as a regular expense. It's really a terrific, terrific service. Research resources, uh, say that 10 times fast. Uh, we have the opportunity through, through cooperatives of tapping into some of the more expensive resources. Um, the value line in Morningstar, for those of you who are investors know the cost of those services. Mm. If you come into the library, you can have those services free. Uh -huh. uh, Ancestry also available through in library use, mm -hmm. and Portland Press Herald and the main newspapers collection is part of our Marvel database, which is a very um, robust database of journals and magazines, both popular as well as specialized. <coughs> Services to children and families. Most people are familiar with these because they've been through a life cycle of some sort, <laughs> and libraries are very traditionally thought of as a, as a child-friendly and family-friendly place. But this is an opportunity for us to also mention that we are working very closely with the school department to make sure that what we're offering is part of a continuum and that we are offering reading readiness skills for children so when they get to school, they have those skills. We also work hard during summer vacation to prevent that slide that occurs. Mm -hmm. Kids can lose many months of literacy skills just by not practicing during the summer. So our summer reading program, which had over 600 kids registered last year, is part of that effort. We also have um, worked with some grants. We just received a grant from the Maine Humanities Council to offer a Shakespeare um, program to the entire middle school next year. Mm -hmm. They couldn't have gotten that grant without the public library participation. So we're always happy to facilitate something like that. We also have recently worked on a cooperative with um, daycare providers and the principals of our elementary schools. Be sure that the daycare nursery school providers are teaching the appropriate skills for the kids <coughs> in the kindergarten so that that is, again, the readiness skills that the kids need. Uh, there's all sorts of um, interesting research behind how important <coughs> it really is for, for readiness when you go into kindergarten. And the principals were really very grateful to have that opportunity to have to be contact with the daycare providers. We have uh, our teen advisory board pictured up on the left. <laughs> Great crew. They get their own aprons now. It's a big deal. <laughs> Uh, in the center, you'll see a, a child, a very tiny child, at a computer. And these are early literacy stations, which are prepackaged with uh, literacy specific, age specific games and activities. 
The keyboard is color coded, so the vowels are one color, the numbers are another color. The mouse is just adorable, it's very small, it's set for a small child's hand. And these are sponsored by Stockel Biddeford Savings. They give us a grant to purchase these. And this is actually, I think, the third generation of these that we've been able to purchase thanks to their support. On the upper um, right hand corner is an example of our discovery kit. We have backpacks filled with topical schemes, audio, toys, um, books, of course, uh, but dinosaurs. Louise, help me out here. What are our three backpacks? Ocean. Ocean. Dinosaurs. And construction. Construction. That's the other popular one. We also have a new telescope. <coughs> We're going to have a telescope orientation program in the middle of next month. So those of you who are interested in checking out our telescope, that's coming right up. Um, in the center there, we have kids making ice cream at one of our maker days. We have um, a superhero who's flying in front of a, um, a sky, so he can have his picture taken like a <laughs> superhero might. And then we have a young person there who's part of our Bookworms Book Club who made her own t-shirt in honor of her presentation. This is the vision that we've recently reviewed and um, adopted and it indicates that we are an innovative leader. And this is where I'm going to turn it over to Tom Corbett, and he's going to talk a little bit more about our innovation. Thank you, Nancy. <coughs> um, my name is Tom Corbett. I'm the systems librarian at the library. So my primary job is to manage the technology of the library, the uh, wireless access, the networking, the workstation, and the, uh, the web, web services. Uh, but my secondary role um, is to um, en en enhance this uh, idea of self-directed learning, especially in this digital age. It's been a particular interest of mine and my background, both as a geek and as a librarian, <laughs> uh, uh, working out ways to, to help with uh, uh, communities with self-directed learning and digital technologies. And as Nancy mentioned, we have already, libraries have always provided this, this uh, role of uh, promoting self-directed learning uh, through books, and, and we still have, obviously, that, those things, and they're still very, very popular. And as Nancy, Nancy mentioned, um, we provide access to uh, digital resources that um, augment what you can find free on the internet. Uh, uh, many of the better resources are, are not free, and so we provide access to that. Um, one of the uh, resources that we just started providing about a year and a half ago was Linda.com, which is a great uh, uh, subscription resource that if you were to buy it at home, it'd be $50 a month. Uh, but it's a, uh, a great resource for, for learning new technologies. Uh, and the bottom is just a, three of the areas that they cover, but programming, learning how to program, learning design tools, uh, special digital design tools and the business skills that are needed in a, in a digital age. Um, so we provide access to that, to our community, both at home and, um, and in the library, with your library card, of course. Um, and uh, we're also interested in, in uh, this idea of, uh, of uh, authenticating uh, the learning that goes on uh, in the library and through these resources. And, uh, Linda.com is an example where you can take these courses and get certified and, and link those and put those into your LinkedIn page and show potential employers and your current employer that you're gaining these skills. So we not only provide access to this resource, but we also try to facilitate that process and work with the public to, to, to uh, teach them how to get these certifications and how to um, manage these badges. And we're also doing our own badging. Badging is a, is a kind of a hot uh, topic now. It's a way to uh, identify to um, uh, informal learning that goes on, especially now in this digital age, that goes on outside of the formal learning structures. Um, and we are participating in this new initiative started last summer called the Main State of Learning and offering uh, badges uh, in teaching. Uh, I, I, I teach coding and, and um, computer programming in the past, and so I, I offer classes now when I can find the time and the space to offer it uh, for, the, uh, for adults to learn coding and to kind of facilitate that self-directed self learning um, using 
our resources and free resources, resources out there. Um, and then we provide badging, which is a, a way for uh, to show that, to authenticate that learning and to, just like uh, the lynda.com certificates, uh, to make it available for employers to see that uh, you've picked up these skills um, outside of formal learning um, venues. And one thing that we're going to be rolling out a lot this summer um, is coding uh, classes for kids. And so we uh, we have a new Minecraft server at the library. Uh, we are offering uh, not only play for, for kids, safe Minecraft environment for kids in the library and from home in Scarborough to use the Scarborough uh, library Minecraft server, but also to use it to, to direct students, to direct kids to uh, all the learning opportunities that there are with Minecraft. One of them being it's a great way to teach coding, to introduce kids to, to coding, to uh, algorithms and to, and to computational thinking, as they say. And Minecraft is a terrific way to do that because it's already captured their interest uh, and they can, and they have an incentive to learn coding in order to further their powers within Minecraft. So we are offering classes to get them started on doing that. Um, the robots are along the same vein. We have uh, uh, these little robots in the library that also can be programmed uh, using a, a, a graphical programming interface that you see behind them, and we're using that to attract younger um, kids to. Uh, to learning how to program. And so we'll be doing uh, some coding classes using the robots for ages for third to fifth graders uh, in the summer. Minecraft will be fourth on up. And then we're also going to have free time Minecraft uh, um, for three hours every Friday for ages fourth grade on up. So those are two examples. We're also doing a scratch, participating in Scratch Day, which is a worldwide event. To get uh, people interested and aware of Scratch, which is another graphical um, um, programming language, and uh, that will also be included in our, in our uh, summer activities. And with that, we'll go back to the mission date. I'll be here to answer any questions at all. Thank you, Tom. One of the things Tom did mention was the lab that we're using for um, the training opportunities that we have here. Um, it's portable by, by necessity. We were very <coughs> fortunate to receive 10 computers from Roof Reusable Resources fully loaded. Uh, we got them for $500 and the inside joke is that our bookkeeper thought that that was a disposal fee and she put them <laughs> under disposal as opposed to an asset. Um, but we got them. Uh, and what it means is that Tom has them on a cart, literally. Every time he wants to hold a class, he has to take down all of the labs and then when the kids come in, they all set it back up again. So that's another example of wonderful things we can do creatively, but it's a pain in the neck <laughs> for Tom. Um, but we're very excited for the opportunity. It's really been fun. The mission statement, uh, as you've had a chance perhaps to scan quickly, indicates that we're going to promote lifelong learning in a welcoming community-centered facility consistent with available resources. So at this point, I'm going to uh, send us into a little quick history of the library building itself. This was the first library mm -hmm. built in uh, 1899. It is a little Queen Anne structure. It was constructed by the same architect as the um, little uh, warming house at the Arena Oaks Park, also the Regency Hotel, um, also the church next door, but it has wonderful architecture inside. Over the years, it had wings put on all three sides and became this. <laughs> Still there, as you might have noticed, on Black Point Road. It is now a private home. They've done wonderful things inside to restore the wonderful architectural details which the 1970 renovations tried to cover up. Um, I want you to note the, the uh, silhouette because when we go to the new building, you're going to see that there was a reason our new building looks the way it does. We tried to honor the pitch of the center, the flat roofs around it. We have three windows at the peak. There are lots of details within the library structure that were to be an homage to the old library because we were losing an institution. When we moved to this building, it was a big deal. This is the opening day interior. The, again, the beams and the open trusses were 
to represent the open trusses that were in the old library. And the use of brick was because we had a fantastic old brick fireplace in the old building. This is it today, somewhat different. I'll back up again so you can see how we pass things in. <laughs> So the current building that we're in was built in 1989, and it was built with the intention of being expanded, which is why it's a box. We put it in the center of the lot with the anticipation that there would be wings on each side, that the expansion would occur in about 10 years, based on growth projections for the town. We knew we couldn't build a building big enough for a very long point in the future, but we would at least make it a start. We, uh, it's uh, 100 by 120 square feet, the open floor plan, again, because we knew things would change. We had, uh, as I said, space on either side for expansion. It's on a slab, and within that slab is a complete grid of conduit. Uh, so you'll see conduit running under our book stacks, again, because we anticipated changes. The mechanicals are on one side of the building to make it easy to, to expand. The drainage was sized for expansion, and the plan, the master plan, included a parking lot as well. <coughs> So this gives you a, uh, I want to capture for you how <coughs> long it took us to get to 2006, which was the point of the referendum that was defeated, which is, uh, again, I want you to, to note, it takes a long time to get a building project underway. We went through a variety of studies, including um, architects and architecture consultants, existing condition reports. We had a fundraising feasibility study. We had um, a library consultant come in and actually do a program document for us. We had an architectural firm come in and do conceptual drawings, which we then used for our fundraising, preliminary fundraising campaign. And I've got an example of some of the, the um, fundraising materials that we put together at that time. The feasibility study for fundraising indicated we could raise 1.5 million at that point. And um, we incorporated SEDCO into our building design because it's a natural partnership for our building. We offer very similar, um, we have similar relationships with the business community and perhaps even more so now that so many people are self-employed and using the library for backup business support. We also were successful in receiving a U.S. Department of Agriculture Rural Development Loan for the building, which allowed us to take the bonding out 40 years. And it changed the, um, the burden of, of debt on the town by putting it on, on this bond. It's likely that at the point we're ready for a library expansion, we will no longer be eligible for a USDA loan because that's for, for communities under 20,000. Mm. That's the bad news. Um, our advisory referendum and keyword advisory referendum in June 2006 was defeated. It was about a 200 vote split. Um, very sad, but um, we. We took the message and moved on to renovate. <laughs> we had um, significantly deferred maintenance in that building in anticipation of an expansion. And as a result, there was a lot that needed to be done. I mention this not only because I want you to see how much has been done, but also to let you know that if we have an expansion project in our future, we don't have to go back to this point. We've already refreshed the current facility. So we've got a new parking lot. We've replaced walks. We've changed the plaza out front. We've done a lot of energy efficiencies, including lighting doors, windows. We've got a new roof and insulation. We've got new mechanicals, including some HVAC upgrades. We've changed spaces around a bit, very small adjustments, but um, helpful ones. We've updated technology. That original um, building project has a huge amount for technology, and we've, we've come up to speed on that. And then we also had new carpet. So we are currently underway with a strategic plan, and this is uh, our second three-year plan. We're using a similar process where we are doing, uh, we've already completed the review of the mission, vision, and value statements. We've completed surveys. We did uh, surveys electronically as well as in-house, and we received 660, we say 65, it's actually 666, um, 665 surveys. Um, we are currently beginning the focus group series, and we have, uh, I believe it's six or seven, I've forgotten now if we lose track, focus groups of various uh, cohorts, including seniors, um, educators, business community, friends of the library, town council, uh, teenagers, <laughs> uh, and we'll get parents involved at, a, at another point. So we are trying to come up with key user groups, we call them stakeholder groups, 
within the community that we can hear from. Uh, this is above and beyond what we received through the survey. And we are conducting interviews for some key um, connections that we know we just can't make it to some of these focus groups, but we really value their opinion. And then we are doing a general scan of what's going on in the, in the general community as well as the profession. And we are um, going to be defining the need for additional space. Uh, we've already been <coughs> identified in the municipal planning process and um, we do have an item in our capital improvements budget for planning for the project and then a separate request for the actual building. Um, our hope had been that the planning would be funded this coming year as you saw the six-year process to get going and we want to, we want to start that process. Um, the town manager has um, changed that to the following year planning, so we just want to acknowledge that that change has been made. We are under no expectation that this building is going to occur for a public safety project, so let's put that right there. <laughs> um, we are in line, we are patient, uh, but we also understand, having been through this, how much significant work is ahead of us. When we go out to ask for something, we want to know what it is we're asking for. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've made some assumptions. Um, we don't have a plan in front of us. We don't want to do that. We want to listen and, and learn from those folks that we're surveying. But we have some assumptions that we're going to need a lot of uh, contrived parts. We, we need quiet study as well as active conversation. We need program space as well as maker spaces. And maker spaces are kind of a new buzzword, but they are a spot where people can be innovative, learn, make, um, the resources and, and information that are so popular today, whether it's a 3D printer or a box of crayons. The, the, the term can mean a million things, but they are very prevalent in libraries now and as a community gathering place, it does make some sense. We have need for group study, for instructional space. I described Tom's lab to you. Um, we need small meeting space. Small business people are desperate for spots to meet with clients or to have conference calls or some gathering place for their colleagues. Art gallery is a large term. What I mean is hanging space for some rotating art. We have no wall space currently, mm -hmm. and we do have many people who would like to have some sort of an exhibit, and we'd like to take advantage of some of the humanity um, traveling exhibits that are available to us. Conferencing through technology, yes, we do have a small conferencing unit, but we'd like to have some video conferencing capability. We don't have the, the, um, the pipe coming into the, the building right now that allows the speed of internet access. We do have high speed internet and we have wireless, but this requires another bandwidth that we don't currently have. Um, and we need some space for collections that um, is not appropriate for us now, but we need a logical flow. Some of you who have been through the building with me hear me refer to the canyon. Our book stacks are absolutely packed and they are very tall and very low. And people with any kind of a disability or a vision issue cannot a, reach to the top or be to bend over for the bottom shelf. Uh, if we were to have any sprinkler go off, it would pack a collection because mm -hmm. the bottom shelf would be decimated. Uh, so we need accessible as well as a logical flow for our collections. And then I pointedly add that we would consider a space for SEDCO again. Again, we thought it was a very good partnership and we'd be very open to that. So here we are. These are among your library staff people ready to serve you. I will mention that we are there to help as it says here, but we really mean it. We do have geeks. We are happy to help you. We also have book lovers and readers if you need some help <coughs> in finding just something. We are desperate to help you. But we also should be very proud because our library staff has longevity and we also have a very high percentage of professional librarians. Library professionals have a master's degree or more and um, we have part-time as well as for full-time master's degree candidates on our staff and we also are staffed seven days a week. So it's um, something you should be really proud of. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope that what this really helps showcase is that the library is such a uh, plays such an integral role with so many different you know, such a cross section of the community, whether it's the intersection with the schools with helping with the summer reading program and helping prevent summer slide. 
that alone, I think, is a huge protection of the investment that this community makes in the schools. Summer slide accounts for two months of lost literacy um, every year, and it can tell. <coughs> so by the time a student is, uh, you know, graduating from high school, 12, 12 years, if they haven't been reading through the summer, they've lost 24 months worth of literacy skills. Mm -hmm. What the library does helps protect that investment. I think that's really valuable. Um, the intersection with the business community, with the um, with all the different offerings that help supplement the business offerings and the, the learning opportunities in the community for the business community, the tremendous programming for seniors, um, all the innovative things that are coding for kids all the way up to adults learning new skills. Um, Nancy is also very involved in um, emergency preparedness, so there's a, a connection there as well with our, our public safety here in town. and. Um, coordinated efforts for emergency response planning. So the, the library has become the hub for so many different things in this community. Um, the, our library is a leader here in Maine, an innovative leader, and it's looked at within the region as well. We have um, participants, Louise, for example, who um, speaks at national conferences. We were the first cloud library launched in the state. Mm -hmm. So it's a real mark of pride for the town of Scarborough that our library um, does all that it does and serves all the, the needs that it does here in the community. So um, so with that, I think we're, we're going to be short on time to do full focus group kind of questions, but certainly we'd love to um, hear any questions that you have or um, input that you have for us or um, discussion that you'd like to have. Yeah, thank you. Time. Thank you, Emily. I mean, I think I speak for all the town council members that the breadth of your programming is is unbelievable yeah. and the innovative nature of the way you reached out to some segments of the community I think this was valuable just for us to understand the scope of what is provided by our public library so I I think that is a tremendous benefit to be here and and I know that all of us are really in, impressed because none of us knew I'm a constant visitor there I use Minerva and the resource librarian taught me how to do those <laughs> searches, uh, uh, and I, I find I can get anything, any movie, uh, uh, any book uh, that I want, and it will just come in my email, in my uh, uh, email, and says it's waiting for you there. So it's it's a tremendous service to the community. Uh, I think people are interested in the um, uh, uh, capital facilities aspect. Uh, and you pointed out that uh, the budget uh, calls for the planning funding to occur in the fiscal year ending 2018. Yes. The fiscal year we're in now is, the budget is fiscal year ending 2017, so it would be one, one further year. We're in the fiscal year ending uh, 2016 and we're working on 2017, so it would be the following year. And maybe you could talk a little bit about the, uh, the timeline uh, uh, that you would anticipate being involved in, in that kind of process to get to a building project. I think one of the first things that we would review is, is we'd want to bring in a, a library building consultant who would review our existing facility, take a look at its capabilities, uh, the consultants typically have some understanding of architecture as well. So they have a, a good sense of how the growth would occur, what makes sense for us, what we might want to retain. Um, they would help us literally, a, a program document literally, it's in writing by golly, um, literally writes down all of the spaces uh, within the facility and estimates how many square feet you might need for the service that's appropriate for your community. Uh, we can do a lot of that as a staff, but what the consultant does bring, is brings in the national perspective and brings in a, a comparative expertise that we don't have. We're, um, I, I say this with all grace, but we're a little parochial. Um, we, we go to national conferences, but frankly, we're from New England, uh, and there's a certain way we do things here which is not to say I don't respect that, because obviously we do. 
but there's also real value in bringing somebody with a, a broader picture mm -hmm. um, who can talk to us a little bit about what our needs are going to be in the future, do a little projection for us on what we might look for. That's even before you talk to an architect. That's, that's the written version. It, it might talk with you. you. We would bring the community in at that point again. We would talk about adjacencies, um, you know, some real basic things. We could tell the architect we, we want to quiet down the children's area and we need space for active teens. They're going to help us articulate what that means. What does that look like in a footprint? <coughs> um, it might simply be a bubble diagram, which is the first place you often start. This bubble goes next to this bubble. This bubble shouldn't be next to this bubble. But um, bringing in another, um, another set of um, brain power and expertise on a national basis would be very helpful. I think that's our first step. Again, all the way along the line, we've got, we have got to involve the community. Um, and that's so essential, particularly since we lost a, a referendum once. Mm -hmm. You know, we're particularly sensitive to that. We need to be listening really carefully. We don't want to be making any assumptions. Do you expect the timeline would be similar to the 2001 to 2006 timeline? Um, only because we do expect the public safety project first. I think we, we could do it more quickly, but that project was also bound by some other uh, initiatives throughout the community. At that mm -hmm. time we were talking senior centers, rec centers, um, swimming pools, the why. There was a lot going on at that time too. So I think we would be um, we would be able to, but we, but practically no, it wouldn't be much faster than that. Okay. But I, I don't think that that should stop us from starting the planning process. Questions, Will? And, and we're still thinking Comment. that that it would be an expansion to the existing building. Yes, um, I say yes uh, because it, it's um, practical. When we before we had the last. Um, referendum, we actually did go through the exercise of looking at other locations in town first because quite frankly that building is an open box and it has the capability of being all sorts of things. So we were open to having the conversation of what if the library were to relocate and be someplace else in town. Um, we were very open to that conversation but it immediately became obvious that we built there for a reason. We're adjacent to the school. We're in a wonderful <coughs> location. Since the point we built, this whole campus has become a much more mm -hmm. dynamic space. Um, the, uh, ironically, the other location we looked at is now being considered for the public safety building. So, that's <laughs> <laughs> been taken. Other comments or questions? Great, great. So, um, it became apparent, I think, when we were working together on the potential for the hockey rink, that there doesn't seem to be a real um, broad comprehensive plan for the campus itself. Mm -hmm. Do you see incorporating these designs and this plan into a broader picture for the campus as a whole, or are you just kind of really focusing in on your, your your library envelope right now, or do you see this as an opportunity to broaden the whole uh, approach to the campus as a whole? That's not an answer I can give you. I can give you my opinion, and that would be only that we would welcome a master plan. Uh, it's uh, it would be helpful to us in our planning also to know yep. what we were going to be next to. Yep. So I, I think that that's um, something that the planner has been working on with the manager and um, we're certainly open to be part of that process and again, again it will certainly help us in our planning. What are we next to? Other comments, questions? Mm -hmm. That was excellent. Mm -hmm. Really, really excellent. I uh, want to thank you for doing this. This advances our understanding mm -hmm of who you are and where you're going tremendously and I think uh, really accomplishes the goal of understanding kind of how the building piece fits into it and, and it's quite obvious that there's all sorts of things that you would do if an expansion was in the future so thank you so with that we'll uh, uh, yes Kate. I just wanted to make the point too that not only were we educated tonight but you know we are we do get played out to the community and it is a good time to start pushing for, for you know, getting more community involvement and, and showing the community what you do. And, you know, I thought that I was educated on what you did at the library, but I didn't know the half of it. And I, it's, it's a, a beautiful program that you run and um, it's really exciting actually. Some of the some of the things that you said were things that um, I can't wait to get my kids involved in. So I think I'm, I'm really, I just want to thank you all very much for coming and really educating us tonight. Thank you.
Did we talk about the basketball? No. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we'll adjourn and reconvene in about two, three minutes. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, hello, everyone. We're uh, back in session. Uh, this is the April 20, 2016 uh, Scarborough Town Council meeting. Uh, and the next uh, order of business is general public comment. Uh, anyone wishing to speak to any matter that is not on the agenda this evening, please go to the podium. Introduce yourself and your address. Uh, we have posted the rules of decorum which I can summarize as if you see how we treat each other, <laughs> uh, you will understand how we expect you to speak to us. Thank you. I, I live the March to Sanctus, 54 Beach Ridge Road. I live near Pine Point, maybe five or six miles. And it's spring. I started going to Pine Point, and I went with a, a niece who said, there's dogs all over the place. And she said that she was concerned that horses don't pick up their excrement, even though the dog people are required to pick up theirs. I was not aware. I'd not been there over the months when the horses were running. But I thought I'd just bring that to someone's attention, that do we have a rule that says the horses are supposed to pick up theirs? Because she says she goes all the time with her children, and the horses do not. The horse people do not. Horses so don't do it themselves, yeah. of course. But um, that the dog people are pretty conscientious, but the horse people do not pick up their excrement. So I just wanted to bring that to someone's mm -hmm. attention. Thank, Part of the permit. Thank you. I'll ask the town manager to comment. On yeah, that. Uh, horses uh, mm -hmm. must be permitted first off, and there is a requirement that they clean up their excrement, um, or the permit can be revoked. That's not to say some people uh, don't break those rules, but those rules are in place and are enforced when, they're, when, when there's a witness. Thanks. Others who would like to uh, speak? <laughs> um, my name is Pauline Levitt, and I live in the Pine Point section of our town. And um, I'm very glad that you were looking into the matter of Second Avenue this evening. And um, we support your, your delving into that deeply because it's a very valuable asset, we feel, not just to the people in Pine Point, but to the people all through our town and perhaps even beyond. It's a, a very unique benefit that you can't duplicate in other places. It should be protected. We should support it. We should actually advertise it and make it available, um, more available to everyone. Um, I think it would even attract, be, be an important addition to attracting uh, outsiders, maybe business outsiders to our town. Um, because they're, they come with families and they have children. We have seen a great presentation about the library tonight. We know that we have a very good school district getting better, I hope, all the time. And we have this asset that nobody else can talk about. So I hope you keep, keep us informed and uh, we're there to support uh, our town in this endeavor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Close public comment. Uh, uh, minutes of April 6, 2016. Uh, could I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, any corrections or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, adjustments to the agenda, there are none. No. Uh, items to be signed uh, are the treasurer's warrants, and I have done so already. Order number 16028 and 16029 are both 7 p.m. public hearings. I'm going to hold the public hearing simultaneously. We'll take separate votes on each. Uh, <clears throat> uh, order 28 is public hearing and action on the new request for a Combined massage establishment, massage therapist license from Crystal Roberts, DBA 
Harmonic Energy Ma Massage and Wellness, located at 254 U.S. Route 1, order number 16-029, uh, uh, is a uh, action on the new request for a food handler's license from uh, Vinal Duty, DBA, a Sweet Frog, located at 300 Gallery Boulevard, Suite B. Uh, anyone wishing to speak on either one of these items, please approach the podium. None. Uh, uh, could I have a motion on order 16-28? So moved. Second. Uh, comment. Uh, the uh, materials that we've been provided indicate that it's everything is in order. Uh, seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, order 16-29, if I could have a motion on that. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Again, everything was indicated to be in order. Uh, Chris. Every time I say this, sample, sample, samples. <laughs> <laughs> Make that part of the process. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can get a sweet frog for you. Yeah, sweet frog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other other point, poignant comments? See none. Oh, Bill, I, I was just going to say my children are going to be very excited that they're going to be reopening. They were pretty disappointed when they closed down. And, oh. and Fantastic. Good luck to uh, uh, all in favor. Opposed? It's unanimous. Congratulations to both of you. Old business. Uh, order 16-30, act to approve the name posted to the Scarborough Housing Alliance by the Appointments Committee at the Town Council meeting of April 6, 2016. And Councilor St. Clair, can you identify yes. who that is for us? Scarborough Housing Alliance. Um, it was Kimberly Fowler. She is being... Um, brought on as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2017. Thank you. Uh, uh, motion on this, please. So moved. Uh, Second. Uh, <laughs> any public comment on this? Uh, Councillor comments. Councillor St. Clair. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to again reiterate, I know I talked about this last time, she's very, very qualified. Um, I think it, it brought the Scarborough Housing Alliance up to um, so they could be um, fully staffed. Um, she's going to be, I think, a wonderful addition to their their group. She comes highly recommended, um, and so we're always extremely happy to have people come forward um, and join our um, groups. So thank you. Great. Other comments, Councilor? Uh, yes, I I know Ms. I know Ms. Fowler. I've known her. We both started in real estate together, um, and I agree she'll be a great addition and bring some. Uh, Great background to that committee. Um, she's done a lot of work with affordable housing and her real estate work, so this would, I think it would be very helpful. Other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. New business. Uh, act to approve the resolve to accept donations for the fuel assistance program. Uh, public comment on this. Anyone wishing to make public comment, please go to the podium. None? Public comment, uh, if I may have a motion on this. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, does this require it to be read, or are we sufficient? It does require it, but it might be a nice touch just to give these folks and businesses a quick uh, recognition. Do you want me to read it? Yes, if you would. Well, I'm, I, I do, yes. I'm very sorry. Um, Resolve, accepting donations for the fuel assistance program, be it hereby resolved by the town council as follows, that the town of Scarborough gratefully accepts the donations from the following businesses and or persons that have been collected to date to be used for the fuel assistance program. Um, businesses, Biddeford Savings Bank, Hannaford Supermarket, KCV Trailer Rentals, Pine Point Ladies Auxiliary, Saco and Biddeford Savings, St. Max Colby Church, Chicago Dogs, mm. Boot Point Cong Congregational Church, Scarborough Higgins Beach Association, Kiwanis Club of Scarborough, Royal Ridge Church of God, Scarborough Lions Club, West Scarborough United Methodist Church, Gorham Savings Bank, Individuals, Nancy Crowell, Delphine Palmer, Donna Stephen, Jeff McLean and Jean Marie Katerina, Will and Aaron Rowan, Patricia Mordecki, 
I, I apologize if Mordecai. that's not how it's Mordecai. Mordecai. Mordecai, my apologies. Mm -hmm. Nancy Robinson, Dorothy and John Sutton, Bill and Molly Donovan, Tom and Carrie Hall, as well as many others who gave so generously. And be it further resolved that each business, organization, and or persons be recognized for their generous donation as a token of the town's appreciation. Sponsor, town councilor. Town council. And this was the fundraising drive for fuel assistance? Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, 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 have we moved it? I think we have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Comments? And thank you for all for uh, making contributions. Councilor Bava. I was just going to say it's, um, it's really nice to see the generosity and compassion that our community shows both at the small business and business level as well as at the individual and family level. I feel a little bit uh, embarrassed for not having my name included on there with so many <laughs> other distinguished uh, councilmen and her councilors and uh, even the manager's family. Well, you can see who probably wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> no conflict of interest. Uh, no conflict there. Uh, <laughs> Councilor Katarina. And please don't forget your clink bags. I mm -hmm. should have some here. I usually hand them out. But <laughs> Thanks. Other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, order number new business. Order number 16-31. Act to approve. No. no. Uh, order 16-32. Act on the request to set the date, time, and location of the school budget validation referendum for Tuesday, June 14, 2016. We have before us, as a part of the materials that are presented and are online available, the uh, form of the referendum so that those who are interested in this subject can see the full form. Uh, in years past, we have, sometimes we have and sometimes we haven't, included uh, a too high, too low question, just right. Uh, it costs us something to do a full analysis of that vote and uh, at the recommendation of the town manager uh, and town clerk that w because it's going to be a large turnout uh, 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 and perhaps we don't learn as much or we already know about as much as we're going to from the vote once it's taken. It was not included, but it is obviously the subject of discussion uh, in addition if it's the will of the town council. So with that, I would ask for a motion. So moved. Second. Uh, public comment. Uh, anyone wishing to uh, speak to this item, please step to the podium. Seeing none, uh, uh, councillor, uh, discussion. Could I just frame that issue just mm. from my perspective? It's this, this is totally a policy prerogative. It's the, it's the decision of council. Um, my recommendations are really are rooted in two things. One, given the expected voter turnout, we will be using machine counting. And with that, uh, we don't have uh, the ability to be as quite exacting in analyzing the results, at least uh, the night of the election. That's not to say we couldn't put some extra effort in following the election to further um, sort the ballots and understand how people voted. Uh, but that does require an extra level of effort. The other thing is more of a professional observation. I've sat with uh, various councils through the years since we started this practice and asked this question, and I cannot recall a time where there were definitive results, frankly. There's always been uh, a lot of confusion. In fact, sometimes it adds more confusion than clarity. So uh, don't misunderstand the fact that it's not on here. Uh, this is totally a policy decision that uh, the council can make. Discussion. Uh, Kate. Um, I, last year, I actually was out for that meeting when it got when it got dropped. I was not in favor of dropping it um, last year, just because I felt like things were so contentious that that information was probably could have been p valuable. Um, I, this year, I also was not in favor of dropping it, um, although after hearing. Um, the town manager's feedback and why that decision was made, I can actually, I, I can respect that and um, also honor that. Other comments? Chris. So, uh, I, I guess to me the question is, is there value in that question? I, I look at it as a, as a tool. It's not the driving factor for determining um, the, the will of the, of the people, but it certainly is a tool. I think how we use that is really up to us um, I, I think it, 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 
if, if there was a need there or is a need there um, and it's not being met by the way the, the question was framed, then perhaps um, we should look at reframing the question to meet the needs. Um, I also very much believe that this was kind of the fallback position should the budget not pass to give some kind of guidance as to, as to perhaps why it, it did not. Um, so for those reasons, um, um, I, I can see why it would be necessary to have some kind of mechanism in there to gauge, to gauge voter opinion. However, I'm going to choose to take the positive road this time around mm -hmm. and hope that the budget just passes the mm -hmm. first time around mm -hmm. and we don't need to really be concerned with um, too low, too high mm -hmm. adequate. If it passes, it passes. Um, so um, while I um, personally think that there could be some, some usage to this, I think we also recognize as a council we reserve the right later mm -hmm. on at another time, at another referendum to possibly put it back in again. But uh, I will support the measure as it stands because I do think that it, it could send a, it should and could send the message that we are very optimistic that this budget should pass the first time around. Councilor Kaz is quite right that we can uh, reinstitute it at any time. This is a, a, just a judgment on the part of the council as an adjunct to the ballot itself. Other comments? Councilor Katerina. Um, I would agree with Councilor Cayazzo's, um analysis of this. Uh, I think, you know, let's put it out the way it's written now. And I'm looking forward to hopefully passing it the first go around because I think we've done so much background work uh, this has been such a different budget process than anything I've seen um, in my time on the council, which hasn't been that long, but I've certainly been involved in prior budgets. I've been one of the people standing up there yelling at the council uh, or the school board or whomever. Um, but, you know, I, I would, if we need to do it on a, on a, if we have like a second vote, then I would discuss it again at that point. So, Councilor Rowan, thank you. So I, I think uh, last year I was one of the people who was upset that we didn't do the vote on the um, uh, did we, that we didn't have the Goldilocks question on the third vote, um, and I think that there will be a number of people that are going to be uh, fairly upset that we're not soliciting that feedback from the uh, from the voter. Um, I feel like it it um, it definitely is a question that raises the contention around the issue. I, I feel like it definitely is, is polarizing. Um, I think as a council. And we're just going to have to do a, if the budget doesn't pass, that we'll mm -hmm. have to do a better job of reading the tea leaves and trying to understand why it didn't pass. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm not sure I would support bringing it back on the second vote uh, for the reason that it, that I feel like it, 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 taking that off the third ballot, I think, helped it pass the third mm -hmm. time last year. Other comments? Mr. Bayvon. Thank you. Um, I agree with everything said with a little bit of um, different perspective. First, I, I do want to say I think that um, in hindsight, the vote that I took last year um, probably wasn't the best decision <laughs> at such a quick moment um, in the discussion and probably should have kept it on that third and final question, uh, third and final vote. However, I'm going to state the same as I did last year. I've never supported this question being on the ballot, including the time in which it was actually implemented. Um, there's only one other community that actually has this on their ballot as well, and they've run into the same animosity and the same contention that we've run into in the past. Um, I, I will state that, um, first of all, there is no statistical correlation between the question that is asked and the outcome, so you don't know through that question whether or not what the real outcome or what the real voter intent is, because you can't sit there and tie a too low vote to a, a no vote or to a yes vote. You can surmise that it's you know, based upon what's happening. Um, personally, the reason why I've never supported this question is that I believe in the public process in which citizens have as much responsibility to be involved at our regular meetings and to express their opinions so that we can take that into consideration when we put the, vote, uh, put the budget out to vote, um, as well as when the vote is uh, rejected, that they come back and continue that participation. Um, this is a democracy by a, ballot, uh, by a survey of questions to try to determine where we're going. It's about a participation, and that is a critical part. Um, I actually believe that this year's process is no different than last year's. What fell apart last year was after the budget was approved at the first reading um, and the vote came down and we stopped communicating with each other. 
the process is exactly the same and it's running just as smoothly with, um, with hopefully a little bit better outcome because we're going to be on um, a better page together. So I think that we are following the same. Um, the bigger issue for me is whether or not question number two is really what the f community should be focusing in on and not the Goldilocks question. And question number two is, do you wish to continue the budget validation referendum process in the Scarborough School Administrative Unit for the additional three years? Because personally, I hope that the council has a conversation and decides whether or not it um, um, either unanimously supports um, getting rid of that process or maybe we become silent as a group, but that's a very big issue for this community and what that process does to us, um, um, both from a legislative perspective, but also from a community-wide perspective. And that is, to me, the bigger question on this. It's not about the Goldilocks question. It's whether or not we continue this referendum process going forward. Personally, I support not having a referendum process um, and that we be held accountable for the decisions that we make as a counselor. So um, I fully support this. I support not keeping the Goldilocks on there. Um, I hope that we actually focus on question number two is the bigger issue. Thank you. Other comments? Councilor. Yeah, and I think I'll just echo everything the fellow councilors have said on the first question, and, and I absolutely agree with Councilor Babine on the second question, and actually it goes to one of our goals, which is around communication. I think it's just more of a comment that on the second question, we really need to think how can we communicate that effectively to our constituents so that they can make an informed decision about this. So really looking to question number two as being a bigger issue for us to kind of focus on and communicate and engage in dialogue. So I will support this as it is. Thank you. Councilor Kaza. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'd be hesitant to, to, to engage in a vote yes, vote no, vote either way on, on a particular item from behind the table here. I think it's up to the community to decide that. Um, I do have my own personal opinion on whether I think that's appropriate or not. Um, and I'd be happy to share that and express that individually at any time. But I, my concern would be that we would, um, uh, I don't want to say unduly influence, but that we would set ourselves up for a contentious discussion in, uh, with the public of, for those people who either support or oppose this one way or another. I think we need to, for this particular question, I think it's important for us to sit back, listen, and let the people decide how they want to approach it. And then once that vote comes back, then we can deliberate how we want to adjust it or address it, should we need to. Um, obviously, if it comes back uh, that it's uh, uh, no, then that's, that's the issue, it's done, uh, it's off the ballot. Um, if it's yes, then um, perhaps we could have a further discussion on the best way to communicate uh, our needs for that uh, and, and a better way to deal with our communication moving forward to ensure that it does continue to pass on the first readings now and moving forward. Thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> do, do we have an idea of, of those years when it's only the school budget referendum that's on the ballot? Do we have an idea of how much that costs us? And should we be informing the voter of the costs associated with that vote? Should we know exactly yeah, uh, what those elections cost us? They're roughly about 3000 Three, three thousand? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. This one will be a little more because it's machine. Mr. Councilor Katerina. Uh Yeah, I, I feel that this, this question number two, the reason it's on the ballot, it's a requirement under state law, I believe it's every three years it's to be voted on. The genesis uh, of this particular question had to do with back uh, 10 more years ago when they did school consolidation. Um, it, was a, it was a political yes. um, weaving together because there are a lot of towns that are not single school systems, single towns. There are multiple towns involved, one school system. So this was a way for towns to weigh in uh, on school budgets. That being said, I, I, I think that it's important that people become educated about the upside downside of this particular um, item on, on this particular referendum. Know that it's on here. And frankly, I will defer to the will of the voters um, with this particular question. So. Thank you. Other comments? Um, uh, on the uh, uh, too high, too low question, uh, almost no one in the state does it any longer. Uh, uh, I had uh, initially, years past, before I had much experience with it, uh, perceived it as potentially helpful. Uh, it never has been. 
uh, uh, I haven't been able to decipher it. Uh, what I've concluded is that people decide to vote for or against the budget for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just whether it's too high or too low. Uh, uh, and uh, they are, believe it or not, as specious as I'm having a bad day. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I don't think we've captured what we want to capture uh, w with the question. And so I would prefer to say it's up or down. Either it passes or it doesn't. The people in this community have elected the seven of us to understand what's going on in the community. And I think this is a, a, a better sense of, of what the vote means than, uh, than any statistical information that we might get from this. So I will support this. Any further discussion of this matter? Uh, seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous, thank, thank you. Thank you. I think we had a record going for the shortest meeting. Yeah, we I do. think we blew it on that. You almost, I think you're gonna <laughs> hit it. <laughs> you're gonna hit it. That only happens when you're in Florida, Bill. <laughs> 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 well, we didn't give uh, council comments yet. Uh, none. Nice. Action items? None. none. Uh, standing special committee reports and land zone reports. Why don't we start down with you, Chris? Uh, so, uh, energy met this morning. Um, did, I guess, some general housekeeping things moving forward about what, uh, what we're going to be exploring uh, as a committee uh, moving forward in terms of some different policy approaches, some different approaches for. Um, uh, recommendations for um, uh, positions that are going to be made through the town manager from the Energy Committee, uh, as well as supporting the uh, the bid for the solar um, grant at the library. Uh, so I think those are two actions moving forward from the Energy Commission that will be coming uh, fairly shortly. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing on the school side of things is the the school department did announce. This is the not a secret anymore. It's all public. Um, Julie Kuchenberger has been chosen as the new superintendent uh, pending successful negotiations, contract negotiations, which I believe are ongoing right now. So I'm hesitant to say that it's official, done, she'll start on a certain day. I think they're still moving uh, along the negotiation standpoint. but I don't know where they stand. That's obviously, a, 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 I don't want to say a private matter, but that's something that they'll address and when they're concluded, they'll, I'm sure they'll make their announcement one way or another. So um, I would like to say congratulations to Ms. Kuchenberger. I did mm. get the chance to meet her um, at the announcement. Um, very excited to, to uh, begin hopefully working with her uh, as, as both a liaison on the council and as a parent as well. She seems to be bringing a lot of energy and some new ideas to the, to the town. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to sitting down and spending some time with her and getting her take on, on how she feels the district uh, should be moving forward. Thank you. Nice. Peter. Yeah, just <clears throat> three quick updates. Um, last week, both the, the Coastal Harbor and Shellfish Commissions met. Um, the Coastal <coughs> Harbor, they, they actually have come up with some signs they're going to be putting up that talks about different currents and other things down at, at the co-op and other places. They also are probably going to bring, and kind of heads up to you, some ordinance forward to really talk about keeping the dots clean and, and that type of thing and giving some authority for the harbor master to, to, to assess fines and penalties and those types of things. Um, Shellfish Kitchen talked a lot about this, this. They were talking a lot about conservation efforts over the summer and who was going to do it and what they were going to do. They're also getting very concerned about um, two things I mentioned which they found interesting. They actually think there are some people that are coming down to the flats at night and harvesting clams, um, what? kind of poaching. And they, they have some real concerns yeah. about that and they're kind of on the lookout for that. So wow. just kind of a heads up. Two, they're also very concerned about maybe changing acidity levels in, in the flats and they're actually starting to monitor some of the soils and other things to see if, if they can trace that and relate it. A little bit of where there's a higher acidity level, they're finding that the, the shells are softer. So they're a little concerned they're gonna start mapping that. Um, and I guess, the, and, and then the only other thing they mentioned, the last storms that we had, the, the rainstorms and wind really moved a lot of the sediment around the, the bars and upper, upper, upper parts of the river that, and they're concerned about what that might mean for the channel and, you know, sediments and those types of things. That was that. Then this week, the senior committee met. A um, couple announcements from that. They have what they call senior drop-ins, which have been every Friday they can drop in at Wentworth. It's going to change starting the last time that it's going to be on Friday is, is June 10th 
and it's going to move to Thursdays until September 9th. They're just changing the dates. It has to do with scheduling conflicts at the school. Um, and they've made a decision that in the past you've had to have a membership in the seniors committee to go on the trips. They've decided that you don't have to have a membership any longer, but if you do go, it's going to be a little bit more for the trip if you don't have a membership. So they're kind of opening it up to more. So those were kind of the highlights of that. And with that, I'll pass the mic or pass the floor or whatever the thank saying you. is. Councilor I'm good. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Baybot. Thank you. Um, first, uh, do the easier ones. Uh, library, uh, you saw their uh, um, presentation in our workshop today, uh, just before this meeting, if anyone is watching and didn't get a chance to see that. Rewind it, it will be live streamed pretty soon and you get to see that it was a great, great presentation about the services uh, they provide and the partnerships that they have throughout the community. Um, it's a testament to their strength and to uh, um, a long history of service for Scarborough. Um, I did want to mention next, uh, Eco Maine has their um, executive board meeting this week that I'll be attending, but I did want to mention, um, I'm going to be providing a little bit more information about some upcoming issues, really more about their financial plans for the future because they are uh, having some struggles given the current market for recyclables as well as for energy. Um, so there is a, um, some attention being focused to that. Um, did want to mention for, um, sorry, uh, Eco Maine. If you want to put it on the calendar, June 16th is the annual meeting um, of the, um, of the, of the um, EcoMaine, and it's held right there at EcoMaine. But the reason for making that announcement is that uh, they have a wonderful speaker already planned. It's Anna Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, oh. She is president and CEO of Goodwill Industries of Northern New England, uh, a pretty remarkable woman with a uh, remarkable family history, as well as uh, she's going to be talking about strengthening our community partnerships through Goodwill. So I think that will be a, a wonderful presentation as well. Um, last is uh, finance. A um, couple of items um, we met today and actually covered th uh, three areas. Um, the library, SEDCO, which is Discover Economic Development, um, and the finance slash assessing department. Um, it was probably one of the quickest uh, finance committee meetings I think I've sat through with so much uh, financial information. It was good. It was very, very good. Um, did want to mention to the chairman, I did mention at the meeting that I thought it would be wonderful if we had um, a workshop style uh, meeting with SEDCO just as we just did with the library to understand um, their partnership with the town um, as well as um, potentially talking about the Haggis Parkway in the future. So um, if we can put that maybe on a future agenda item, workshop item. Um, did want to mention there are four dates that everyone should be aware of. The first is uh, Wednesday, April 27th. It is now our annual town budget forum. That is from 7 o'clock p.m. to 9 o'clock p.m. at the um, high School Auditorium. Um, I do encourage everyone to go online um, to our portal. You can submit questions in advance. We do ask for them in advance, primarily because it, it simply allows us to do the research and to make sure that we have the resources available to give a complete and um, thorough answer uh, to all those questions. We don't screen any of the questions. Um, and so uh, we will make sure that we get through all of those at the forum we did last year and we will make sure that we do that this year. I um, also wanted to mention that Thursday, April 28th at 2 p.m. is a joint workshop for the Town Council's um, uh, Finance Committee along with the School Board is um, following our regular uh, schedule. The agenda is available and it should be published pretty soon. Mm -hmm. um, Wednesday, May 4th is the next um, Town Council Finance Committee meeting. It's from 4 to 6. We'll be covering Community Services Administration and Public Works. Um, um, very big um, items there. And then the last um, for future, which is the bigger one, which is Wednesday, May 11th from 4 to 6. The two items um, on the agenda first, we'll be talking about the staffing proposals um, that were submitted as part of the budget but aren't included in the budget um, and going through kind of a, a validation discussion with the manager and other staff on those positions. And then a final recommendation and vote of the Finance Committee on what we'll be forwarding to the Town Council for their consideration. Um, also wanted to mention even greater news. Um, it was let out of the bag a little bit earlier, but I'm really, really pleased to uh, acknowledge and announce that um, S&P, San and Poor's, announced today that they are upgrading the town of Skyro's credit rating. Um, that has been upgraded to a, excuse me, from a double A to a double A plus, uh, which is uh, really significant. They cited five, uh, six key areas, uh, improved revenues, um, Excuse me, I um, can't read my own writing. Improved reserves funding, improved debt profile, retaking control of the Haggis TIF, 
um, lower tax in increment financing. Um, strong management, stable economy, and I saw a footnote that said something about a really strong finance committee. Um, I could have misread that, but uh, um, I, I thought it was in there. Own writing. <laughs> I can't read my own writing. But um, I just wanted to say thank you to the staff. Um, it's, it's about their hard work, and um, even though I joke, it is about governance and how we engage with staff and how we uh, contribute to that management process. So I want to thank the finance committee, both of uh, past and current. Um, and I do want to say that the reason why this is pretty significant is that we're also going through the bond process. So they go through this evaluative process before the bond season, which is May. So um, this one item alone helps us, generally speaking, um, on a $7.5 million bond will save us about $75,000 in interest expenses, a $10 million bond, about 100000 So um, that's, um, you know, that's, that's a very significant issue. It also is a prelude. Um, and hopefully a, sing um, a signal of what Moody's will then do, which will hopefully increase us from a um, AA3 to a AA2. So um, kudos to staff and to the town um, because it's about all of our hard work and how we contribute to that. So really appreciate it. Good. Always like to end with good news. Uh, uh, thank you. And, and uh, all of us thank the Finance Committee. It works harder than any other committee we have. Uh, and it's week in and week out uh, uh, for uh, April, May, and into June, and so uh, uh, the Finance Committee members should be recognized. Will, your comment. Thank you. Um, I know I mentioned this last time, but I just wanted to mention again that we um, are having a dedication ceremony, or excuse me, the Historical Preservation uh, Implementation Committee is going to have a dedication ceremony for the Danish Village Arch um, on May 18th. Um, I believe the time is 5.30, um, but it'll be before um, the council meeting, so hopefully everyone will attend and hopefully some people from the public will be able to make it. Um, we'll have a rain date for May 22nd. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Councilor Katerina. Uh, yes, uh, Long Range Planning and Vision Committee both met separately, uh, two separate meetings, but we're working on the same things, which is planning for the comprehensive planning that will be taking place uh, over the next couple of years and uh, the implementation of the STAR planning process, which more explanations will come out about that. So if you're interested, please you know, stay in touch. Um, I went out yesterday as the chair of the firing range committee and visited all of the firing ranges in town. I'll have you know. Um, there are four. I didn't realize we had four. Uh, Scarborough Fish and Game I'm familiar with because my husband's a member there and I've, I do skeet shooting there and target practice there. Um, Scarborough Royden Gun, which is, a, it, which is a small, it's a long building on Holmes Road. People ask about it frequently. I visited that. And they <coughs> here, um, doing really well. Uh, I have a number of programs there on gun safety and just, you know, target shooting and whatnot, indoor target shooting. And then I visited two private ranges. So that, that was very interesting to see um, what's going on uh, in town in the interest of the uh, other members of the Fire Range Committee who make sure they're safe. The big thing is to make sure that people understand gun safety and they're not toys. And, and um, it's just very interesting chatting with the, the uh, fellow members of that committee. As you know, I'm also on the Maine Municipal Legislative Policy Committee, and even though I don't go to Augusta at this time of year, we get emails frequently uh, asking us for feedback on various bills that uh, come through and what should Maine municipal position be. Uh, I know that Maine Municipal was very strongly supporting the solar bill that has come out. The Senate passed it. Um, Unanimously, um, I was extremely disappointed in two legislators from Scarborough, Representatives Vashon and Siraki, who voted no. And the reason I say that, and I'm going to give a disclaimer here, I have solar myself, so I'm going to, but I'm going to take that out of the picture. I'm speaking about it from a municipal viewpoint. We've made uh, investments as the town of Scarborough in solar, and I would hate to see us. Uh, it's helped us save money. It's been a, it's a great investment. It's a good investment in our future and in our climate and everything else. But I would hate to see those benefits eroded because of some ideology 
that may be going on and some misinformation about what rate payers are paying and subsidies and this and that and the other thing. Um, so I did want to publicly thank Senator Volk, Senator Millett, and Representative McLean. And I would um, ask that anyone who's interested in this give a call to Representatives Vashon and Soraki and see if you can convince them. Because if we can convince just about 10 more legislators, um, the governor's guaranteed to uh, veto it. He's already said pretty much he's going to veto it. Um, we may be able to override that veto. So that's my soapbox for tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, I served on the uh, search committee for the superintendent. I thought it was a great experience. Uh, we had some very good candidates, and I really want to congratulate the school board on the selection of uh, Julie Kuchenberg, uh, a really superior candidate, tremendous energy, uh, a very good communicator. I think she is going to provide uh, a wonderful leadership uh, for, and I know she was very, very strongly endorsed by the school board. They're very pleased with the selection, and I think the community will be as well. Uh, I sat in on uh, uh, the bond rating uh, service call with Moody's uh, to understand better that experience. I never practiced in that area. Uh, so uh, it was uh, very educational, uh, and it was a very well-received presentation by uh, the financial people and by the town manager. Uh, uh, before we got going this evening, we had a workshop, uh, as was mentioned by Councilor Babine, on uh, the library. Uh, I think we were all blown away by the scope of services. I would encourage anyone who uh, uh, wants to see more about what the library's up to, to watch it. It will be out on TV, public TV, uh, shortly. Uh, and uh, uh, it really was a terrific presentation. Uh, next, we'll have the town manager's report. Yes, um, surprisingly, I have two simple items. The first is to remind councillors the Scarborough Community Chamber will be doing its annual municipal officials dinner. You've all received an invite. It, uh, it is scheduled for Tuesday, May 10th, 6 to 8 p.m. They'll be right here in Oak Hill at Bella Vita. That's the new <coughs> living facility. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great opportunity to connect with the business community. Um, I found it to be very uh, a nice evening. So to, I'd encourage you to get back if you have any issues and you've lost that. I can certainly respond on your behalf if that would be helpful. And I just wanted to update the council on a matter that you've taken up. Uh, the Energy Committee made a series of recommendations regarding solid waste reduction. And one of them was simple re-education about what's recyclable. Um, the committee worked with actually EcoMaine in developing these stickers, which we now have. And over the next two and a half weeks or so, Public Works staff uh, will be going around town and affixing these stickers <laughs> to the top of uh, the cart. So everyone will have one. It will be a constant, hopefully daily reminder uh, of uh, what's recyclable and what's not. Good. We also introduced the notion of compost, which is uh, mm -hmm. kind of an emerging piece of this conversation. Uh, so that notion is captured on these as well. We expect we'll have to drop back and do some additional work uh, when the summer folks come back. But we'll get the majority of them out in the field in about a two-week time frame. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That's it for tonight. Great. Thanks. Why don't we uh, start with... Council members' comments uh, down at this end. Councilor Baba. Thank you. Um, just a couple quick comments. One is, um, again, also congratulations to the school board and to the entire school community um, with their selection of Ms. Kuchenberg. Did I pronounce that right? Kuchenberger? Kuchenberger. Berger. Uh, what a name, huh? <laughs> um, got a chance to meet her. It's just, it's, it's kind of like the, I had a funny giggle when it, they mentioned Sweet Frog. I don't know why. It's one of those nights, I guess. Um, what, a, what an incredible person. Um, just her, her resume alone is, as, is uh, absolutely wonderful. She brings a lot of um, uh, background and curriculum and instruction, and I think that um, it's going to be a nice, uh, nice fit for Scarborough um, as well as for the community as a whole. And uh, last, I, I just think it's a very exciting time. You know, uh, we heard from the library, as they call themselves, so I'm not, uh, they call themselves library nerds, because then there's our finance nerds <laughs> like me. You know, when I got the news about the upgrade, I, I got to tell you that, you know, um, it, it's kind of a measure of how successful we are as a council, but also as a, as a board, um, sorry, as a staff and the services they provide, and then as a community as a whole, because it talks about the strength of our community, the strength of our economy, um, contrary to the naysayers who say that we're not in a recovery 
uh, situation. Um, it's just, I think it's uh, wonderful news about where we're moving and I hope that we take advantage of that in our planning um, going forward. Uh, I would mention for those who aren't familiar with uh, Julie Kungenberg's uh, background, uh, most people like to see a well-rounded person, a person who has taught, who has yep. been a vice principal, has been a principal, uh, has been the director of curriculum, uh, and then she topped it off in her young career, and this is a young woman, uh, as the assistant superintendent of one of the largest school systems in Massachusetts. So uh, quite an impressive record uh, uh, by Julie. So I think everyone will enjoy having the opportunity to meet her. Uh, will. So um, I just wanted to, uh, uh, there was an article in the uh, Scarborough Leader last week about the, uh, the backpack program, and I just wanted to thank Mike while he's here. I really appreciated that. I think um, that it's a really important um, uh, program that's being run by the, by the schools and a lot of volunteers um, to, to help feed some of the, the people in our community that are hungry. Um, I also wanted to um, remind everyone about the um, Scarborough Kindness Project Compassion Dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's next Tuesday here um, at seven. Seven. Yep, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also going to be um, televised, uh, and it'll be recorded and on the on the Scarborough TV website. Um, but we have a, a couple of great panelists, um, and I also wanted to, to thank the other town councilors that have been very supportive of the Scarborough Kindness Project. I know my wife had a Facebook post where she named only a couple of you, but I wanted to express <laughs> my Gratitude to all of you. You've all been very supportive, and thank you. Um, and lastly, Tom, thank you. The clock is back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a fancy one. That's all <laughs> sodium. That's a brand new one. That's all. Thank, thank you. you. If we can get out by eight, uh, is there anything else we can do? How's <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, see, we're, uh, bear with me. I don't, I've left my regular book home, and so I've been scribbling things here. A couple of things, I, meant, I forgot to mention the Conservation Commission, I was away so I wasn't able to go to it, but they had a, I guess a really <coughs> successful workshop on composting and they had something like 50 people here? 65, 60, I heard. Oh, was it 65? So that was, that was really good. I um, was glad to hear about that. Seniors need to know that the food share program has started. Some of you may be aware of it. If you are, I, I believe it's a single person under make you know with an income of under twenty two thousand you can qualify for a fifty dollar voucher that you can use at local farms and I know Broad Turn Farm and Firth Farm and Flaherty's and I think just about all of them here in in town take these vouchers. You can learn more about it at the Senior Area Agency on Aging and I apologize I had the phone number written down and as I said I brought the wrong notebook with me. Um, I've also been out meeting with, with people um, and one of the things I've been talking to a lot of people about is our, our new tax rebate program um, and they've been very interested in that. I hand them out the, uh, the information that's available online and it, it's, it's been personally satisfying for me to be talking one-on-one -on -one to some of our most elderly people in town, to be honest with you, who had no idea. They still hadn't, it hadn't sunk in that we have this program and it's separate <coughs> from the state and anything else. So I want to thank uh, those, Bill Donovan and, mm -hmm. and uh, Craig sitting out there and whoever for working on that. And I should say at uh, your request or your suggestion, oh, right right. tomorrow we'll have an easy button, if you will, on our homepage. Uh, the material has always been available, but you have to kind of dig for it. So we're trying to make it front yeah. and center and easy to access. So that will be yeah. effective tomorrow. So anything any of you can do out in the public, even if you don't qualify for it yet, it's age 62 and over, income of $50,000 and under, and 5% of your property tax, that's the essentials of it, um, that um, please tell people about it so that they know and can take advantage of it. Um, oh. oh, here's the number. Tony just gave me the number. Hold on. 396-6500. So 396-6500 for the Senior Area Agency on Aging. Um, and then I just wanted to talk very quickly. I know we've been getting getting some emails about Pine Point and Avenue 2 and whatever. Um, I want people to understand that personally myself, I public access is critical and that's where I 
stand on this, and I believe my fellow counselors are very supportive of making sure we continue public access wherever possible. So please be assured of that. And that's it for me. Thank you. Councillor St. Clair. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, I, two quick things. I'm sorry, you caught me off guard. I'm, I apologize. Well, um, no, 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 it's okay. I'm back. <laughs> um, I was, I'm back. I'm back. Well, I don't make it brief because we're, I'm trying to get under the clock for everybody. <laughs> um, I just wanted to actually thank um, Councillor Chiazzo. He um, and I met today for uh, took two hours out of his morning um, to kind of bounce some school things off of him, some questions that I had, um, not only about um, some budget questions, but also um, about some concerns that I've had um, myself and some, some emails from some other parents that I've received about some of the ongoing issues that we've seen um, with some of our students um, that have been kind of hitting the newspapers. And um, so I was very, um, he, Councillor Chiazzo was very receptive to my concerns and actually we're going to have a meeting next week um, with the chair of the Board of Education and then hopefully following up with the principal at the high school. Um, and I will make sure that I keep um, at least those parents that contacted me. Um, I will follow up with them, but I'll also be posting that on my Facebook page, what we get out of that. But I think um, one thing that I said to Councillor Chiazzo is, you know, we really, in, in our younger children, we really push and push and push um, about bullying and how they shouldn't bully when they're younger. And um, the Scarborough schools does a great job with, um, you know, our K through two with um, their Kelso choices and things like that. And so I just wanted to make sure that, you know, that's being followed through also. Um, you know, some of, some of our older kids are, are, are being really challenged at this point. And so um, I was really, I, thank you. Um, I was really happy with um, the conversation that we were able to have and I'm, I'm hopeful that um, we're gonna have some good information that we'll be able to pass back on to everybody and just, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's get that the clock's getting closer. Not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'll just be quick and kind of pile on um, what Councilor Rowan talked about, but I'd really encourage folks next, next Tuesday night, the 26th, the Scarborough Kindness Pro Project is going to host a compassion dialogue here, and it's going to include a panel of students and community leaders, and it's going to really talk about how can we have healthy conversations as a community, and I think the work that they've already done has really made a difference this year. So I think we're seeing that in mm -hmm. the budget process and some other things. So just really encourage folks to tune in or participate. We're really trying to find a way to have different levels of conversation in our community that are civil and respectful. So thank you and hope everybody dials in and thank you, Will, for your wife leading the charge on that. I think it's making a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Gaze. So I'll also try and be brief because I have, now we're over 8 o'clock, so, um, <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll just run through a quick bullet list. Um, stickers, um, thank you Tom for, mm -hmm. for mentioning that. Um, I did want to point out because I, I have teenage boys, just a reminder that those are town property, so if they go on please don't pick them off because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they, uh, they are meant there to be educational and um, just a reminder that, that those, the, the barrels belong to the town, not to individuals. So hopefully they'll stay intact. Um, uh, I, I did want to touch a little bit on um, the, the referendum question that we talked about. I, I don't want people to misinterpret what that is. Let's stay focused on the budget mm -hmm. and let's mm -hmm. stay focused on the good things that we're doing. Not that anything that happened here was, was, uh, wasn't positive. I just don't want people to get the wrong impression. Um, we're working really hard as a council to be collaborative. Um, we, I, I, and I want to thank each one of the councillors for that, um, I, I think, very positive exchange. We, we do have different ideas and different opinions, but ultimately I think we come together and, 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 and make the right decision. So I don't want anybody out there in the public to feel like, uh, you know, this, this wasn't a thorough or thoughtful discussion. I, I think we've all, uh, you know, come, come to our own conclusions about this. And let's stay focused on moving the budget forward and being positive on that, on that side of things. Um, along those lines, I want to thank Councillor Rowan for his responses to um, some of the ongoing questions about um, the plovers and the dog situation. Um, I personally have not weighed in on that for, for a variety of reasons, but I do thank Will for, um, for his response. I thought it was very articulate and very well placed, and I did want to let people know that I am receiving those emails, um, so please don't uh, interpret my lack of response as a lack of caring. I'm always very cautious, though, to engage in 
debates and discussions online, and I'm not suggesting that Council Rowan did that either. I think he was very articulate and, and his response was, was very measured, and I do appreciate that, and I, I certainly would echo his comments and, and support his comments uh, very, very much so. Um, the high school issue, again, you know, Kate, I, any, I, two hours, as I said before, was probably the best two hours I had today, so it was a busy day, so thank you for the time yourself. I just want to also be clear that um, I, I, I have two children at the high school. I'm very comfortable with the programs and the, and the, and the policies that they're doing there, and that's something that we discussed as well. I don't think that there are necessarily any challenges there, but I do think if there are questions and concerns, then they do need to be d addressed either with the administration or, or with the, the school board. So I don't personally feel like there's any pressing issues there that are shortcomings or discrepancies that need to be addressed, but certainly we want to make sure that people uh, get that information and get communicated effectively and properly there. Um, and then I guess I'll end on the positive note. Um, I, I thought the library uh, presentation was spot on. Um, uh, the town as a whole should be very proud of the services that the library offers. Mm -hmm. It's a good <clears throat> reflection of our community and where we choose to spend our resources, and they're a great example of doing a lot with a little. We do a lot of uh, public-private mm -hmm. partnerships. The programs and the resources, certainly it was amazing to me some of the things that they're offering that I had no idea about, and I've been here for 15 years plus. So um, I would encourage you to use those resources, reach out to those people. They're yours. Uh, we've, we, we support them uh, with taxes and with, with, um, with uh, sponsorship, if you will, or with, with mm -hmm. participation. So I would encourage you to, to reach out and use those facilities as well, and I want to thank them for that wonderful presentation today. Thank you. Uh, April is always a challenge on our beaches. We've got three wonderful uh, beaches in Scarborough, and uh, April 1 is the date when we have uh, the regulations kick in for uh, controlling where dogs can be, when they can be off leash, when they can be on leash. Uh, and so there, there has been some challenges at, uh, at Western Beach that have been brought to our attention. Uh, uh, I did confer with the uh, Protzneck Association business manager about signage that Protzneck Association had uh, uh, posted last year, and that is going to be reestablished this uh, uh, this week. So that's going to uh, help things out. Uh, she also noted, uh, much to my satisfaction, that she was bringing to the attention of the policeman who's down there frequently uh, and the animal control officer the need for close monitoring. So that people are reminded that it's a change back to April 1st again. Uh, it was reported today that uh, we had our first nest and it was on Western Beach. Uh, so uh, uh, that, that program of uh, protecting an endangered species has been very successful uh, and it, will, and it was, has allowed us to uh, somehow find our way through the needle uh, and uh, keep dogs on the beach and in most of the beaches off leash in portions of the beaches. So I'm very pleased with the way that's gone. Um, April 15th has come and gone, another April date that lives in infamy. Uh, everyone has to file their taxes. And of course, the uh, 1040 uh, is sort of the cornerstone of our senior property tax relief program. Mm. So people who now have a 1040 in hand uh, and they make less than $50,000 and they're over the age of 62 and pay property taxes here, should be investigating whether they are eligible for both the state and the local, uh, not uh, uh, separate, you can get both. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something you should be looking at. Uh, very pleased to see uh, how that's going to turn out. Uh, lastly, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever had this experience of buying something on Craigslist that costs more than a few bucks uh, and having to do a cash transaction. I once bought a car on Craigslist and I was being required for the only time in my life to carry about $10,000 in cash uh, uh, to a McDonald's where we <laughs> transferred the title. Uh, and it was a little unnerving to tell you the truth. And about a month or two ago, I saw a little article in the Portland Press Herald that said uh, that uh, a police department here in Maine had set up a safe area. And so I mentioned it to uh, Chief Moulton, and he said, I love that idea. Uh, and it's one of the things that I really most admire about Chief Moulton is he isn't, it isn't just crime, it's 
public safety and the interests of, of the citizens of the town. Uh, he is posting on his Facebook page tomorrow uh, the following. Effective Friday, April 22nd, the Scarborough Police Department is pleased to announce a new safe zone area at the public safety building. We recognize that there are times that people need to meet with other people for a variety of reasons and would sometimes feel more at ease if there were a safe place to do that. The parking lot near the front entrance to the police station on Westwood Avenue is now able to be monitored by camera from the communication center, which is staffed 24 hours a day. In the event that residents need to meet with someone in a safe environment, we would invite them to do so in our parking lot. This could be to complete an online sale, exchange custody of children, execute a document, or a variety of other sensitive reasons why you might want to have the protection of knowing that it's being monitored by the police in the building. And the press release goes on, it will be on his Facebook page tomorrow, and the press release goes on to say, go inside, tell them you're doing it, They'll make sure that they take care to watch the monitors that are outside uh, to make sure that you are safe. So uh, uh, thank you, Chief Moll. So with that, I will ask for an adjournment. Move so to adjourn. Thank you. All in favor?